Welcome, friends, and this is again your program, Economic Update. My name is Richard Wolf. I'll be your host, and I want to welcome you, as always, to this program, part of the work of the Pacifica Network. Our task in Economic Update is to analyze major economic events, those of the recent past that we can help think about as we shape our own decisions about jobs, incomes, futures, debts, and all the other aspects of how an economic system works. As your host, I've been a professor of economics all my adult life. I currently teach in the Graduate Program for International Affairs of the New School University in New York City. I also write regular columns for a variety of publications, including Truth Out, and I want to urge you to take a look at their website, truthout.org, where you will find a constant daily compilation of news and analysis that is remarkable, independent, and worth a look. Truthout.org. If you are interested in more elaborations and uh, discussions of the issues we raise on this program, I urge you to take a look at the two websites we maintain for that purpose. The first is rdwolf with two f's dot com, and the second is democracy at work dot info. We assemble there interviews, video, audio, written work, all kinds of materials uh, designed to be attractive and informative and to elaborate on the kinds of things we do on this program every week. Lastly, you can also sign up for the newsletter we produce twice a month, free of charge, which also provides more information and alerts to all kinds of documents and interesting uh, pieces of insight that will help you follow the economic events of the time. Please also remember that we want your comments and questions. They are flowing in at a very impressive and very encouraging rate. Please send them either way to the two websites that we maintain. Both of them have a mechanism for sending us your thoughts. rdwolf.com or democracyatwork.info. On both websites you will also see a little word called donate. It costs money to assemble the team and to do the research and to produce the programming that you see here and that you will find on the websites. We need to ask for people's help who benefit from what we're doing. Please click on the Donate button and offer whatever you can afford. It will be encouraging, it will be helpful, and it will keep us on the air and doing this kind of work. We'll begin with a few short economic updates, as we always do. Over the last week, there were two big media events in economics that drew a lot of attention. So let's start with those. The first was the meeting of the G8, the eight most developed industrial nations who chose a very remote resort in Ireland. They're always fearful of people with protests coming. And they got together to talk about the world economy, still going through the sixth year of its global crisis. And as usually happens at these meetings, they couldn't agree on much. And what they ended up doing and saying they did was stunningly uninteresting. Perhaps the only area where there was some movement, and not a lot, was in the area of cracking down on wealthy people and corporations who have been exposed recently by the events in Cyprus, by the earlier events in Ireland, and by a number of scandals across Europe. These are uh, exposures of tax evasion individuals and corporations moving money around the world basically to avoid paying taxes, although there may be other reasons involved as well. So they said they were going to become more vigilant. They were going to establish more rules. Well, this is a little lame to be polite. They've been establishing rules for years, for decades. And yet the recent exposure indicates that this has not succeeded in preventing wealthy people and corporations from moving their money around the world 
to avoid paying taxes. Some of this movement is legal in the sense that it doesn't violate an existing law. Some of it is illegal. And indeed, that battle gets raised. There are, of course, particular prosecutors in particular countries who've long ago discovered that the laws are there. It's just a question of whether the political time and the political power allows those laws to be enforced or not. So I was interested in a case that also came up this week that shows you don't need a big pronouncement and you don't need another set of rules. What you do need is a set of circumstances that makes the prosecutors go after these companies when they are flagrantly violating the law and the spirit of the law in terms of paying your fair share of taxes. So here was the case that caught my eye. Dolce and Gabbana, a leading fashion house that many people have heard of. Guess what? In Milan, Italy, prosecutors of the Italian government found Domenico Dolce and Stefano Gabbano guilty of having moved their money, in this case out of Italy, into a shell company, a not really company that was just there for the purpose of tax evasion, in Luxembourg. And they basically carried out a transaction between their Italian company and this uh, shell company set up in Luxembourg, moving the location of their profits so that they paid a low rate of taxation in Luxembourg um, instead of a higher rate of taxation they would have had to pay if the business, which is an Italian business, reported its profits in Italy. They were fined, and they were sentenced to jail. The jail term seems to have been put aside, but they owe $13.4 in a kind of penalty for what they did. And the Italian government is talking about a possible tax bill, bill of 400 million euros. That's half a billion dollars, which might put the company out of business. And they're complaining how unfair that would be. Stunning of a company that has been getting out of paying its fair share of taxes for a long time. And so we are thankful to the prosecutors in Italy for doing with one company occasionally what of course could be done and should be done in all European countries and in the United States regularly, which would take an enormous bite out of the so-called deficit. The government doesn't have the money, not because... It's spending too much, but mostly because it isn't raising the taxes from the very people who keep focusing on government spending in no small part to keep the spotlight off of their tax evasion tactics. The second update today you might call a tale of two countries, Turkey and Brazil. How different they are. In Turkey... There has been an uprising now for several weeks of young people, but now a growing part of the population, including two of their four major trade union uh, associations, against the government of Erdogan, he is the leader there, uh, demanding an end to destroying city parks for the benefit of malls and mosques, of trampling on human rights and workers' rights at the workplace, particularly. That's what's got the unions involved. And a big coalition uh, is coming uh, together. They had demonstrations last week in 77 Turkish cities. The response of the Turkish government has been repression, violence, 7,000 injured protesters, five killed, a tre tremendous explosion in that society, in which the government deals in repression. How different the government in Brazil. There, there were also demonstrations over the last week or two, but this was by people angry that the government's economic difficulty is being worked out on their backs. In particular, the government's decision to raise bus and subway fares. And the people rose up and said, no, thousands of people, Across Brazil, we will not be made to pay for the costs of an economic crisis we didn't cause and from which we have already suffered. But there's a different government. The leader there, Dilma Rousseff, 
coming out of the Brazil Workers' Party and the tradition of Lula, their former leader, has already, after two days of demonstrations, said she congratulates the demonstrators that have renewed democracy in their country and showed the importance of people's actions to show what they want. And she has rescinded the increases in uh, fares on the city buses and fares on the subway. Workers' power in the streets, democratic protests, get what the workers wanted to achieve because a government understood what it ought to do. A tale of two different cities, Brazil, uh, two different countries, Brazil and Turkey. Next update has to do with austerity in Europe. Austerity is simply the name for trying to deal with the crisis, not by stimulating the mass of people's purchasing power, what you might call trickle up, helping people at the bottom and hoping it develops as a solution for the economics. Austerity is the opposite. You help people at the top and you cut the mass of people. You tax them more and you spend less on social programs. Europe has been following the austerity path, and here are the results. May was the worst year in car sales in Europe in 20 years. Every major car company reported severe declines, and this is the worst it's been in 20 years. In the 17, area, uh, 17 countries of Europe that share the euro as their currency, the current rate of unemployment, the result of austerity, 12.2%, much, much higher than in the United States, a crippling level. And to show you that Europe is not alone in feeling the costs of the austerity policies in Europe, the sales of cars in Europe by the General Motors Corporation, a U.S. company, slid 11.6%, a serious problem in Europe becoming an important downer here in the United States. We have austerity here, too. The government of, of Mr. Obama began this year on 1st of January by raising the taxes on average people, the payroll tax, from 4.2 to 6.2 percent. And a few months later announced that he's working out with the Re Republicans cutting Social Security's payments for the mass of people. Wow, that's austerity. Seeing what is happening in Europe, it's a wonder that we want to pursue that kind of a policy here. But that's how the people who run the show seem to be thinking. Fourth update. Both in Europe and America, there is, thankfully, a program to go after a stunning legal strategy of the large drug companies. It's called pay to delay. And let me explain. When a big drug company starts with a new blockbuster medicine that millions of people need... It has a patent. It has a protection under the law for a certain number of years. When that period of time runs out, anybody can produce that drug. They are no longer just the company that started it. And so typically what happens is generic drug companies, com companies that basically produce this compound in their own labs, come forward and offer it as a cheap alternative to the high prices charged by the companies that have a patent a certain number of years where they can charge whatever they want because nobody else is allowed to produce it. So what happens when that period of time runs out is that the price of a drug can drop as much as 90% because suddenly companies come along, the generic companies they're called, and produce and sell at a low price the drug that's no longer protected by the patent. So the big drug companies who don't want to lose the multi-billion dollar incomes they get from being the only one allowed to produce it and charging a sky-high price have entered into legal agreements with the generic companies paying them money not to produce and sell low-cost generic equivalents to the drug that's losing the patent. And the Europeans and the Americans last week took steps to deal with that, finally. In Europe, the European Commission fined the Lundbeck Corporation, a Danish corporation, together with several generic companies, for doing this, for having the company preserve their high-priced 
drug with no competition by paying the generic companies not to do what they were now legally entitled to do, namely to produce and sell at a lower price. The fine, $195 million. Here in the United States, we have the same thing, but much milder than the Europeans. We need to go very slowly here to bother the big drug companies. The U.S. Supreme Court decided last week to empower the Federal Trade Commission to sue pharmaceuticals who engage in this pay-for-delay program, leaving the drug companies able to have more months, more years of charging more for medicine than it needs to be charged, forcing more money out of the United States' public, out of European socialized medicine, buyers of drugs. Many of these drugs are antidepressants and pain medication. It's interesting to think that the large pharmaceuticals, already billionaires in profit, are making many of their billions by withholding from people who are depressed and in pain the kinds of access to medication they could afford if generics produced them at 60, 70, 80, 90 percent less than those medicines are being uh, priced at by big pharmaceutical companies. Where's the morality here? Where's the decency here? Let me turn now, as we often do, to a couple of major topics that need some analysis. And I enjoy doing this partly because these are issues that you send me comments and questions about. They're in the news, and they are major shapers of what is happening, both in the economies of particular countries and in the world as a whole. This one is particularly acute in the United States, but what is happening here is likely to be reproduced elsewhere. I want to talk first today about the crisis in student financing. Let me explain. Education is a social good. It has always been understood that to educate a population is to allow all of us to live a better life than we could without education. That's why we instituted in the United States in the 19th century public schools. We didn't want to leave it to the individual decisions of a family, of a neighborhood, of a community, of a city, of a state, whether to educate. Education is something that ought to be a human right. It is something that benefits not only the person being educated, but everyone that person touches in the rest of his or her life. They can do more productive work. They can be more helpful to the people around them, not only to the people they work for in a business, but to their husband, to their wife, to their children, to their neighbors. You get the picture? An educated life, an educated person is a social asset to the whole community. And so it was understood that if the whole community benefits from something as important as education, well then, it, the costs of schools, whether that be the building or the teacher or the custodian, all the people who make a school function, ought to be a social expense. We all ought to share in maintaining an institution from which we all benefit in countless ways. And so it is that here in the United States, 90% or more of the education of people from kindergarten through high school is a public activity, paid for by public funds in public institutions. And 80%, 75 to 80% of the higher education, colleges and universities, is likewise a public service in the United States. But in this era, era excuse me, of uh, cutting back on the public sector, out of this mindless notion that if the public is doing it, it somehow isn't appropriate, and if the private is doing it, it will somehow be wonderful, We've just seen how wonderful it is to have private drug companies. And we've just seen how wonderful it is to have private fashion companies uh, evading taxes, etc. But I won't go into that. Here's what's happening in public finance. 
Money is being withheld from our public schools. The excuse given is we're in an economic crisis. But of course, it doesn't take genius to understand that if we respond to the public crisis by cutting back education, we are crippling ourselves going forward. You know, public education is the way we develop the skills of our working people. The quantity of trained working people, reading, writing, arithmetic, technical training, scientific training, all of it. That happens in our schools, which means it happens in a public institution. And if you starve the public institution of the resources it needs, it can't generate the quantity and the quality of graduates from our elementary schools, our high schools, and our colleges and universities that we need to compete in a world economy. So if we're crippling our own education system, we're shooting ourselves economically in our own feet. It's irrational to do. And yet, here's the numbers. Over the years of this crisis, we have cut off, laid off, fired, several hundred thousand people working in our schools and universities, public schools and universities, across the country. A staggering statement. And you can begin to see it by the rise in tuition. Our schools are not being funded by the government the way they once were. And so they're having to raise the cost to individuals, the families of students, the students themselves. And we can see the results. Off the chart, student debt. Students facing an economic system that isn't working well, our capitalist system, in a crisis to boot, are frightened by the prospects for their job futures, for their income futures. So many of them decided, particularly in the early years of this crisis, 2008, 2009, 2010, and so on, to go to school, to stay in school longer, to re-enter school in order to beef up their credentials so they have a leg up on getting a job or a job with decent income. So they borrowed money. Why? Because we're in a crisis and many families can't afford the money to help their kids go to school. They have to borrow. This is not rational. This is not a collective way to handle this problem. We're leaving it up to each individual family. That means a family who can't afford it will have to deny their very capable child an education and deny all of us the benefits of educating someone with such wonderful capability. Meanwhile, a family that has a lot of money can send a much less capable child to college. We lose from this arrangement. That's why we didn't do it that way in the past. But things have become so gross that I'm going to give you two examples of a system obviously out of whack. The first was a story that swept the Internet last week. It turns out that investors in the United States, rich folks, have come up with a new gambit. They have found a way to make money off the desperation of young people. Young people who don't want to go into debt for fear of what that might mean, and they already have debts. Families who cannot afford the cost of an education and who can't go into debt or not enough debt, they have a new option now. Wealthy people will invest in a young person. They will give that young person a chunk of money, enabling them to go to college, for example. And what do they get in return? Ready? A cut of the future earnings of that person. This is called, or uh, let me be more accurate, this was called earlier in American history indentured servitude. It's a slight cut above slavery. You are selling your future to be able to go to college. You're promising to give somebody a portion of your earnings for years into the future so that you can go to school. Wow. You know that was when we began as a nation. Many people leaving Europe couldn't afford the passage on a boat to come to the United States 
or what was then a British colony. And so here's what they did. They got an American employer to pay for the ticket. And in exchange for the ticket, you were a servant, an indentured servant it was called. You had to work for that employer, either in his business or in his home as a servant, for a certain number of years at little or no pay to pay off the cost of your ticket and interest on that cost. That was eventually abolished because of the massive abuses to which it gave rise. But here we have, in our modern country, centuries after we outlawed indentured servitude, our economic financing of education is so screwed up that we're bringing back such a grotesque practice. The second gross index of the absurdity of education finance in the United States is the following fact. The Congressional Budget Office in Washington reported that the federal government is making billions and billions of dollars in profits. There's a debate over how much, but that's not the point. By its loans to students to help them go to college. Here we go again. Students who need to borrow money in the way no generation before in American history ever had to do. This is a new thing, the burdening of a generation of young people with huge debts as they begin their lives. The government is providing some of the loans, but it's charging interest much higher than what it costs the government when it borrows that money in the capital markets. The government pays in the neighborhood of 1% to 2%, and it's charging students anywhere from 35 to 7 or 8%. Get the picture? The government is making money off of what it used to do in the way of subsidizing public education. It is imposing burdens on the young people which are inappropriate. The government shouldn't be making money off of students. It's busy subsidizing General Motors. It's busy subsidizing the uh, uh, American International Group insurance company. It's busy sub subsidizing the banks that lend for mortgages. Why is it not subsidized? Making money off of students? Extraordinary. Last point. You know, the effects of this are not only to drive a growing number of young people to say, I'm not going to college. I am not going to become a technically developed educated person. A loss for all of us. That's not all that's happening. But these debts are forcing young people to make decisions that have enormous economic consequences. For example, instead of pursuing what you love, what you have a passion for as a young person, and we know that if you do what you love, if you become educated and trained in what you love, you'll be much better at it than if you choose a course which maybe pays you a little bit more, but for which you have no passion. But you know, if you have a debt that you're facing, if you're worried about the debt, more and more young people are choosing where the money is so they can pay the debt. We will all lose the productivity we could have gotten as a nation if we didn't make debts and money the criteria that people use to decide what to study and how to spend their lives. Here's another example. Young people getting married, living together, who have accumulated debts are making other kinds of life decisions that affect this society. They're deciding, for example, to postpone or not to have children because they can't afford them. Wow. Here's a society that loves to talk about family values, preventing families by loading up young people with levels of debt they didn't expect and with a job market that will not enable them to pay them off. Young people are deciding to live where they don't want to because it's cheaper and they can pay their debts. We are imposing all kinds of decisions affecting our population, our location of people, the level of productivity, the kinds of jobs, extraordinary consequences. Why? Because we need or want these kinds of changes? We don't. We don't even discuss it. We simply impose debts on this generation of students. Thoughtless, dangerous, bad consequences across the board. 
A society that does this to itself ought to recognize it's in deep trouble. We're going to take our mid-program break now, as we always do. It's very short. Please return in a few moments to us as we will continue Economic Update. Welcome back. This is Economic Update. I am Richard Wolff. We are going to enter into the second half of today's program. I want to welcome you to it. Indeed, I am going to jump back into a, another topic for an analysis in a moment, but I wanted to remind you again, since many of you have asked, of the two websites that we maintain where you can follow and explore the kinds of analysis you hear on this program, pursue the documents that are relevant to it, follow, in a sense, the analysis as it develops over time. The first website is rdwolf, with two Fs, dot com. And the second one is democracyatwork.info. Those are the two websites where you can go. They're connected to one another. And again, as we say, both of them have donate buttons. And if you find what these programs do interesting and useful, and if you find those websites interesting and useful, Please remember, it costs us money to produce these programs and those websites, and anything you can do to help defray those costs will be enormously helpful and greatly appreciated. There's also a bi-monthly newsletter, free. You go to those websites, you can sign up for that. We'd be glad to have you part of our community. The second uh, discussion I want to go into today is one that arises every day in many of our lives when we either buy a lottery ticket or pass a store that advertises the sale of lottery tickets or talk with a friend or a relative about lottery tickets. And I want everyone here to understand what the lottery is, why the lottery arose. You know, for most of the history of the United States, lotteries, like horse racing and so on, was considered a form of gambling. And given the Puritan beginnings of the United States, gambling was seen as intrinsically sinful. And so it was banned outright or sharply limited. How far we've come. We now have a country in which lotteries are everywhere, betting on all kinds of races is everywhere, etc., etc. So let's take a look at the explosion of lotteries. And to make the point clear that I want to emphasize here, I'm going to tell you about some research I did a few years ago when I was living in the state of Connecticut, and I came across two very interesting maps of Connecticut. And let me tell you what they did. The first map was a map of poverty in Connecticut. And you had a map of the state and a little black dot in all the places, in all the zip codes of the postal system, where there was a percentage of the population, say over 30%, who lived below the official poverty line. So every dot on the map talked to you about or showed you a poor area of the state. And as you might expect, the major cities of Connecticut, Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport, were the concentrated locales, there were some others, but they were the concentrated locales where poverty was concentrated. Next to that, I put another map that also had crossed my desk. It was a map which also had little black dots showing where significant quantities of lottery tickets and lottery numbers had been purchased by the people of Connecticut, or at least by people in Connecticut at the moment they made the purchase. I put the two maps, one on top of the other, and guess what I discovered? They were almost identical. What's the lesson here? The overwhelming majority of lottery tickets are sold to middle and lower income people, particularly lower income people. And if you think about it, I guess it isn't all that surprising. The lower your income, the more you're pinched for funds, and the more the fantasy of buying a ticket for a dollar or two 
and suddenly being relieved of your poverty would be attractive. Even if the fantasy only lasts a few hours between the time you buy the ticket and the time you discover, because that's what's likely to happen, that you didn't win anything. In those few hours, you can fantasize, you can have a pleasure, you can imagine, and have that conversation with your co-workers or your friends and family. What if I won? What then would happen to me? That's the good news about the lottery. You get a few hours of fantasy pleasure. And I don't deny it. But I'm a, I'm a program about economy. And this is an analysis of economics. So now let's look at the hard economics of what a lottery is and what a lottery does. Over the years, corporations and the wealthy, as I have shown time and again, have shifted the burden of taxes in our country, federal, state, and local, off of their own shoulders, that's what they get from controlling politics, and on to the mass of middle and low-income people. They've been successful in keeping taxes off of them. But they have gone so far to push the burden of taxes onto the middle and lower incomes that for the last many years, 20 years or more, the middle and lower income levels in the United States have pushed back we can't stand any more taxes. We will vote for anybody, no matter how strange what they say, if we think they can help us avoid more of the taxes that the rich and the corporations have pushed on us. So, starting 15, 20 years ago, state governments began to discover they can't raise any revenue anymore. They don't dare touch the rich and the corporations because they'll turn against these politicians. They don't want that. They need the money from those people to run their campaigns, to run their parties, to run in office. But now they don't dare tax the mass of people because the anger there is so enormous, they'll be voted out of office. So what are they going to do? They cut programs, that's part of what they do, but they also are always looking for new ways to get money out of people, particularly middle and low income people, because they dare not touch the rich and the corporations. Enter the lottery. The lottery, the scratch ticket, all of that is a way of pulling money out of middle and especially lower income people where you don't have to admit you're taxing them, even though the lottery is a tax system and that's what I'm going to explain. The lottery takes from everyone who buys a ticket money. Millions and millions of dollars. If you tried to tax those millions out of those people, you might have a revolt in the streets. Instead, you sell them a few hours of fantasy. You charge an enormous amount of money. Just for the sake of an example, let's imagine in, in State X... The lottery this week raises $100 million. You take a small portion of it, 25, 35, 40 million, and you give it out in prizes. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But you take the rest of it and you use it partly to pay for all the people who have to work in a lottery, including the store where you bought it. They get a cut. But the rest is used by the state. It's a tax revenue-like income, isn't it? It is, in fact, a tax. It was set up as a substitute, a kind of trick to tax more money out of people. And it's working. It's bringing more and more money into the state because people are willing, for that fantasy hour, to buy a ticket. But now let's look at not only is it a tax and should be understood as such, but take, let's take a look even at that portion of it that is given back to people. And here you'll see the economic irrationality of it. If those dollars, two, four, six, twenty, that an individual uses to buy lottery tickets, if that individual hadn't done that, that individual being a middle and lower income person, we know what they would have done. They would have bought something 
food, clothing, shelter. They would have spent that money. And that would have created demand, that would have created purchases, and that would have created jobs. Instead, we take little bits of money from many people and give a huge chunk of money to a tiny number of people, the big winners. And what do we know about big winners who suddenly come into a lot of money? They almost always save a big chunk of it because they're now rich. When they save money, they're not spending it, which means a lottery reduces the purchases of goods and services in a society by taking much money in little bits from medium and low income people and converting it into the money of what is suddenly a rich person who saves a portion. This is a crazy thing to do in general and doubly crazy in a crisis time where we need more purchases to generate more jobs to soak up the unemployment. So a lottery is a disguised tax, was created to tax the people who otherwise would have resisted. It's an escape for the corporations and the rich. They don't have to worry about the finger of tax revenue coming to rest on them where it should have been all along. They can postpone the day of reckoning when they finally pay their fair share because they found a new way to suck money out of the middle and particularly the lower income people. Sell them a fantasy, a scratch ticket, a lottery. Something to think about as we go forward in an economy that increasingly does not work well. Part of what this program is, is an attempt to make that clear to everyone. Because the first step into making the changes that are long overdue in our economy is to have an honest appraisal of what is actually going on. I'm going to take more time today than I normally do answering questions, responding to comments. And before I do that, I want to tell you why. I have been feeling guilty. So many of you have taken the time and trouble to send me your thoughts, your comments, your criticisms, your questions, that I simply have to choose a small portion of all those that come in to respond to. I use the others to shape the whole structure of the program, the topics we cover, the approach we take. But I still have to pass over many very good questions, very intelligent comments, uh, from which I learn, and I appreciate them. So I thought this time I would take a little more and try to work through a bunch of questions, uh, appreciating in advance uh, that you sent them to me. Uh, so let's get into it. First question uh, says, suppose we had in the United States a single-payer medical insurance system an arrangement where we don't have private insurance companies, but the government basically functions as a single insurer of everyone. It's a much cheaper way of working because it needs many, many fewer uh, personnel. We don't have the competition of multiple com companies, each one of whom has highly paid of officers, each one of whom has a expensive headquarters with expensive shrubbery outside, etc., etc. In other words, if the United States had the kind of single-payer medical insurance system that has been successfully preserved for many, many years in our neighbor to the north, Canada. So the question is, if we did that, wouldn't we lose all the jobs of all those people working for the private insurance companies that would no longer be needed? And isn't that a problem? Good question. Let me answer it as follows. First, you're absolutely right. If we had a single-payer system that would economize on the clerical work and the inspection work and the filing work, all of that, that would mean many fewer jobs. That's why it saves money. That's why most countries do that, to save the money for all of the people paying for medical insurance because we could do, solve that problem much more cheaply. And so it's yes, those people would lose their jobs. But you know, that's what economic history shows us happens all the time. Let me remind you of some examples. 
when cars replaced horses and carriages, the people in the horse maintenance business, breeding them, feeding them, cleaning them, uh, taking care of their medical needs, building the carriages, fixing the carriages, decorating, all those jobs disappeared. Instead, we had an automobile industry. We lost jobs when change happened. I'll give you another example. Americans used to go to restaurants run by a family in their community. We used to call those mom and pop restaurants. What happened to all the moms and pops and all the people they hired when we shifted over in this country to fast foods, to McDonald's and Burger King and Pizza Hut and all the rest of them? Millions of mom and pops lost their livelihoods. Third example. We shifted culturally at a certain point a few decades ago from service by a service worker to self-service. You do it yourself. We're all familiar with that. You used to go to a gas station. Somebody would come up and put gas in your car. Now you go to a gas station. You do it yourself. You used to go to a restaurant and have someone prepare a salad for you. You now go to a salad bar and you do it yourself. That lost millions of people jobs they once had. So yes, there are changes like movement to a single payer system that would lose us jobs. Interesting question. Does it always happen like that? No. Sometimes the people who risk losing their jobs, can put together the political power to prevent that from happening. Even though it would be counted progress, even though it would be counted something benefiting the majority of people, but those who don't want it have the political power to prevent it. So it is with the insurance companies. They're not doing it to preserve jobs because it's not the workers that are making the difference. It's the companies who make the profits, who can buy the political support to prevent a single-payer system. That's why we don't have one. And so we're not making the change. A little bit like imagining that the horse and buggy people had the political power to prevent us from having cars. The rest of the world would have cars. We would be enjoying our horses. If the horse and buggy people had had the power that the private insurance companies have today... That would be the result. It's only a question of politics. If we had a rational society, we would say the following. Wow, let's move immediately to a single-payer system because it gets us all the insurance we need at a fraction of the cost we are now wasting and paying, which we can't afford. And let's at the same time have a government program, a first-class government program, to retrain and place all the people who lose their jobs. We will pay them while we retrain them. That would mean we're not afraid of progress. We're not afraid of moving to a better medical insurance system any more than we were afraid of moving to a car system instead of a horse and buggy system. Why? Because we would have taken care of the people who temporarily lost a job, retrain them, and get them another job. Lord knows we have many things to be done in this, city, in this country. Rebuild our cities, take care of our old people, do something about our educational system. Lots of work to be done for those people. We don't need to frighten them with unemployment. Then we could get the benefit of a cheaper ed medical insurance system and not have to suffer the unemployment of those people. So thank you for raising the question. That would be my answer. Second, isn't it true that worker self-directed enterprises, workers co-ops, businesses where the workers democratically make all the decisions are really a utopian idea, this listener to the program asks us. Uh, they haven't worked in the past, this listener says, and so uh, it really isn't reasonable, it isn't practical uh, to advocate for them, no matter how beautiful it would be if we could. Good question. I get it fairly often. Let me respond briefly. There really is no evidence, none in the record of economic history, to presume that collective or cooperative enterprises are any less successful than capitalist enterprises. 
Can you point to workers' co-ops that have gone out of business, that have failed? Absolutely. You have uh, examples of that. But you also have examples of capitalist enterprises that collapse. In fact, if you look at the records in the United States, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of capitalist enterprises have failed, say, in the last 10 years. They've gone bankrupt. They've had to be merged into another company. They collapsed. So there's a record of failure across all kinds of enterprises. And collective enterprises are no more likely to do that than any other kind. In fact, in order for us to have a test to see which in general last longer, we'd actually have to establish what we might call a level playing field for such a test. We'd have to create in the United States, which I would support immediately, a whole raft of collective enterprises, democratized worker co-ops, that would be functioning effectively, and we could then compare at all different sizes how well they do with their capitalist counterparts. Then and only then, could we talk about the viability? Mondragon, that I like to talk about, is now almost 70 years old. It's gone from six workers to over 100,000. It's clearly an example of co-op lasting well, doing well, no utopian imagery needed. Okay, let's turn to the next one. Um... This question is critical of me. It says, why do you call capitalist enterprises undemocratic? After all, workers enter voluntarily into working as a worker in a capitalist enterprise, doing what you're told by the employer who runs the business, etc., etc. And a worker can leave whenever he or she wants. So why do you call them undemocratic? And my answer is, the right to leave is not what makes a, a firm democratic. You're right. People can leave an enterprise. You're right that it's voluntarily entered into. But let's remember that when the uh, amendments to the United States Constitution that outlawed slavery were passed, they outlawed slavery. You, can't, you don't make slavery legal because somebody voluntarily agrees to be the slave of somebody else. The fact that you entered into it voluntarily doesn't change the fact that it is illegal. If we didn't want there to be exploitation of workers, we would likewise make it illegal for one person to be the employer of another, just as we made it illegal for one person to be the owner of another. And the right to leave, however useful that is, that doesn't tell us anything about the right to be in a democratic workplace. These things are really different. What I would argue is, not only should you have the right to leave, but what sense does it make if when you leave an undemocratic enterprise, all you've got is the opportunity to survive by working in another undemocratic enterprise? Because that's what we got in 99.9% .9 of our enterprises. To really have democracy, we would have to have, again, a level playing field of lots of places where you actually have democracy on the work. It's a little bit like saying to a people in America, if you don't like our undemocratic system, you can always leave. Yes, you can. And I'm appreciative that you can. But that doesn't really go to the question of having the opportunity to have a democratic workplace, which is not too much to ask, I wouldn't think, if after all, you live in a society that commits itself to democracy. Um, last question we'll have time for, comes from Phil McCarthy from Virginia. Thank you, Phil, for giving us the uh, authority to mention your name and your residence. He really wants me to comment on whether I believe in the possibility of campaign reform. Can we put limits on the amounts of money that individuals and corporations give to candidates and parties? And he asks an interesting particular question. Can't we do something to prevent uh, charitable, educational, and religious institutions that meddle in politics, that try to affect the laws from being tax-exempt? They should be made to pay. Well, 
I have two reactions. The first one, let's face head on and not skirt it like other people do. This question of church exemptions for churches, for mosques, for synagogues, and so on. We have an exemption that says if you're engaged in that activity, a religious activity, you don't have to pay taxes. But what do we do when a church organizes to combat, say, an abortion ruling it doesn't like? Or a temple organizes to uh, support a political candidate and have its parishioners do that, etc., etc. That is political activity. And mostly in the United States, the authorities have been afraid to challenge and question it. Phil is right. That shouldn't happen. And Phil is also right that we should limit the amount of money. But pardon me, Phil, if I'm skeptical. In an unequal society like we live in, where the inequality is getting worse, the rich have to control politics or they will lose the popular vote, which will turn against them. The people will use the ballot to undo the inequality created by capitalism. To prevent that, rich people always have, and corporations always have, find, found ways to get around these limits. And that why, way, if you want to avoid corruption in politics, you've got to level the playing field in the economy. Thank you, as always, for your attention. This is Economic Update. I'm Richard Wolff. I look forward to seeing you and speaking with you again next week.